Thanks, Anna. So speaking is Mara Lonazak, and I'm a, a group leader at the Sanger Institute. And we're going to talk today about um, vector biology and some reference genomes with uh, single mosquitoes, some single mosquitoes using PacBio. Uh, because you can't see us, I thought it would be nice to have a picture of us. Uh, I'm on the right, and Sarah Kingen is on the left, and she's a staff scientist at PacBio. We're going to basically split the talk into two, and I'm going to go first talking about um, generally anophthalmia species diversity and um, the importance of vector control for malaria control, and also in a little bit about population variation and um, how this new low input approach is going to help us move forward with doing a lot um, more anopheles genomics. And I'm also going to tell you some kind of nitty gritty details about high molecular weight extractions on single insects. And then Sarah will take it from there, talking about haplotype assembly approaches, going into some detail over the low input protocol, and then what's coming next for PacBio. So um, Anopheles, which is the main species that my um, species group that my lab works on, uh, they're they are the major vector um, for human malaria. In fact, they are the only vector, Anopheles species are the only vectors of human malaria um, species across the globe. And the, the burden of malaria is really still very high. And um, a recent study in 2015 tried to evaluate the impact of various control measures and discovered that actually the most effective control measures against averting malaria cases are the ones that target the mosquito themselves. And those are represented in these pictures here on the left. So ITNs are insecticide-treated nets that protect people sleeping under them. The mosquitoes land on the net and try to bite the person sleeping and are exposed to insecticides there. So it's not just physical protection. It's also, it's from the bite, it's also delivering a dose of insecticides to the mosquito. And then the other major approach is indoor residual spray. So that's where the walls of people's homes are sprayed with insecticides and the mosquitoes that after they bite people, the females will go off and rest on the walls to digest and then they're delivered a dose of insecticide. And you can see in the colors here, the green bars show the impact of the nets. There's been a huge impact of nets, much bigger than those sort of light purple bars that are representing the impact of the frontline drug against malaria that people take once they have the disease. The problem with these gains is that they are majorly at risk, and in fact, the last couple of years has shown some plateauing in these reductions of malaria, where drug resistance and insecticide resistance are threatening all of these gains. Not only is resistance a major problem, though, in the, in the fight against malaria, but actually Actually, um, the vector control measures that we have primarily target the species that come inside to bite people at night. And actually, the complexity of the species that are transmitting malaria, um, many of those don't have those behaviors. They bite outdoors or they bite at different times of day. It's estimated that there's about 500 different off these species across the world. I'm sure that that's an underestimate. And that about 10% of these are major vectors. And among those 40 or so mosquito species that we know are transmitting a lot of malaria, there's a, there's a huge amount of variation in behavior. So um, to try to understand um, some of the variation that exists within a single species genetically, a few years ago, we, a couple of years ago, we published um, a sort of first glimpse looking at 765 wild-caught mosquitoes, and this is using Illumina sequencing, 30x steps per, per sample. And these are mosquitoes that were collected from all over these areas where you can see dots on this map of Africa. And the red are um, Anopheles calutzii, which is, um, we didn't sequence quite as many of those, and those are the sister species, but also a major vector to Anopheles gambi, which you'll be more familiar with potentially. Um, and we are, in this project, we were trying to create a sort of a baseline to understand what is level, what are the levels of genetic variation like in this species, and what is population structure like in these species. And I'm not going to give you a detailed, you can read the paper if you want to look. We, we discovered a lot about population structure, but I thought I would give you two examples about resistance. 
and the problem of resistance. So one of them is we took a very close look at a gene that in, actually in many insects is known to be responsible for um, resistance to DDT and pyrethroids. And insects tend to evolve the same amino, it's a convergent mutation, it's this leucine to serine or leucine to phenylalanine um, change in this voltage-gated sodium channel. And um, if you just look at that site, because we know that site is, is important for resistance, so many studies will just look at that site. Do we have resistance or not in this population? And um, we know that West African mosquitoes tend to have the phenylalanine mutation, and East African mosquitoes tend to have the serine mutation. And so it sort of looks like there's two arisals of, these, um, of this resistance in the population. But um, when we dive a little bit more deeply into the data, which is represented here by this, by this figure. So these are now looking at haplotypes across the full kind of 70 KB region that the VGSC gene um, comprises. And where you see those dark black bars um, interspersed with white, those are representing the two alternate mutations, so L995S to, or L995F. And you can see that um, each of those black bars is representing a set of mosquitoes in which a haplotype has newly arisen that has that mutation, that it has that new mutation that's conferring resistance, but it's on a different haplotypic background. And so by looking at this whole region at a haplotypic level, we can say that at least 10 times just in the samples that we've sequenced, this mutation, these mutations conferring resistance have, have evolved. And in some cases, in, that ca in, the, in the very long black bar to the right where you see kind of blue and, and red haplotypes interspersed, these haplotypes have spread across vast geographic distances, so that's, um, that's like Burkina to Angola, and also between species. So the interspersal of the blue and the red is where alleles have, have crossed species boundaries. Now, as I mentioned, insecticides are very useful for these mosquitoes that come inside, to target against mosquitoes that come inside, where they're going to get a dose against on the bed net or on the walls. But there are many different species that do not come inside. And so, and because also resistance, infectious resistance is such a major problem, there's a lot of work ongoing now um, to, to, de to, develop, to develop gene drive systems that will target mosquitoes. And none of these are yet implemented in the wild, but there's a lot of research in this area. The two main classes of gene drive approaches that are under development aim to either suppress the population by targeting uh, like a fertility gene, for example, or distorting the sex ratio and eventually eliminate it, um, or they, they, are, they carry some kind of cargo with them that, that actually protects the mosquito from transmitting the parasite. Um, and that's called population replacement. So population suppress suppression and population sorry, population suppression and population replacement are the two main areas of research right now in terms of gene drive for Anopheles mosquitoes. Both of these approaches have actually already been demonstrated in principle in the lab, represented by these two papers here. And there's work that continues to try to build these into robust tools for vector control. Um, now, and both of these approaches use CRISPR-Cas9, which as you will know, depends on um, a sort of homing guide RNA target sequence, represented here by the red uh, ends, which for the case of Cas9 has to end in this NGG. And so for the guide RNA to effectively target the cut, um, these 21 bases have to be very highly conserved. And we know that mosquitoes have a lot of genetic variation. Um, in the paper that worked on suppression, we, one of the genes in particular, now they were by no means proposing that this was, this was, the, sol this was the solution for gene drives, so I don't want to blow this out of proportion, but, but one of the most promising targets that they identified in that paper, which they demonstrated in the lab actually was, was doing drive based on this um, figure you can see in the lower right-hand corner where the allele is rapidly increasing just over four generations in its frequency. Um, well, that, that gene drive mechanism depended on this 21 base pair guide RNA conservation hitting that gene. And so among those 765 genomes that we sequenced, we just looked in the wild, what kind of variation is segregating in the wild already at that guide RNA cut site? And what you can see here is kind of a window of about 200 bases in the Anopheles genome, and then that 765 individuals all stacked up. And so everywhere you see blue, that individual had a allele that was identical to the reference genome. And anywhere you see green, it was a heterozygote, and red, it was a homozygote for an alternate allele. 
And just within that 21 mer, we can see that there were eight segregating variants, some of which were at high frequency. So effectively what this means is that resistance is actually already out there in the population to gene drive at this particular target site. And having some understanding of the variation that's out there will really help um, prioritize target sites for, for gene drive approaches. We actually extended this analysis to the full genome to look actually across the 13,000 or so annotated genes, how many of them have invariant guide RNA targets. And actually, less than half the genes even have a single invariant guide RNA target. And then when we try to do some multiplexing, imagine that actually any kind of realistic gene drive is going to target multiple sites in a gene. So um, about 2,000 genes remained uh, in the sort of running for having more than three invariant guide RNA sites. So there's a lot of variation out there in these mosquitoes, and um, having a bunch of genomic data to understand where in the genome there's less variation or what sites are ide ideal to try to cut um, is useful, I think, for gene drive uh, vector control. In fact, we also think it's very useful for insecticide resistance. And at Sanger, we've been working over the last couple of years, and this will continue on in the future, to create what we call the vector observatory. And in this project, we are sequencing using Illumina data thousands of individual wild-caught mosquitoes to try to understand genetic diversity and population structure and eventually build in the information about what control measures are in place in these populations to try to understand how mosquitoes are evolving in response to the control measures that are actively targeting them at that time. And I see a lot of, a lot of possibility here for long-rate approaches, actually, because, because we gain so much from having really good haplotypic information um, in, these, in these samples. So what I can say also is that um, all of the data I've just shown you depends on having a reference genome. And very, although there are quite a few reference genomes for Anopheles, more than 20 species now have reference genomes, very few of these are high quality. And the pest reference genome was actually the second insect that was ever assembled, and that was in 2002. Um, but it took many years of effort and millions of dollars. And, um, and in fact, the newer genomes that were, that were reported on in 2015, about 20 different species there, those were all um, also only generated through pooling individuals. So, and pooling individuals overcomes the DNA input requirements but causes a lot of problems downstream um, because of all the variation that I've just shown you and told you about. To some extent, variation can be overcome by inbreeding. So if you can do multiple generations of full slip inbreeding in your insect of interest, then this helps but it's never fully complete. You always have pockets of variation left in your species. And um, it's also a lot of work. And it, actually, for mosquitoes, it's proved incredibly difficult. So they often, if you try to inbreed them, they're, they're really very, very reluctant to inbreed. They kind of die off pretty easily. So the better approach would be to just reduce the number of individuals that's required for generating a long-rate assembly down to one. And that was the origin of this collaboration we started last summer with PacBio. Now I'm going to tell you about high molecular weight extractions. Um, and we've tried out a variety of different approaches. And I think the one that's worked the best for us is this Kyogen MagaTrack high molecular weight DNA kit. It requires an investment up front because it needs a magnetic rack, which is not cheap. Um, but once you've got it up and running, it's pretty easy. And there are kind of two versions of this MagaTract uh, kit. One is we call standard, and that's just doing it exactly by the book, the instructions that come with the, with the kit. And the other is the 10X modified version, and that's based on these pages here, which I've listed from the 10X uh, manual on trying to get, uh, it's, it's doing um, a, slightly, a slight modification to this kit to try to get higher molecular weight molecules. Um, I want to note here also, so if you end up taking up this advice and using the MagaTrack kit, um, if your insects are small, you can get away with reducing the reaction size by quite a lot. So we're actually using half a reaction per mosquito now, and I suspect we could go further than that. And the beads, which are part of the kit, we're actually using a quarter of the reaction for those, so only 10 microliters per extraction. In terms of tissue, um, with a chat, I, uh, I had to chat with them. Um, with um, Fringy and yeah. John Cuttington, and over this chat we were discussing Drosophila and Anopheles, and it looks like for both of these at least, um, we are guesstimating that about 0.01% of the weight of a fly is DNA. So if that helps guide you in terms of how much weight of tissue you need to get to a certain amount of nanograms for this, hopefully that's helpful. So <clears throat> this is a femtopulse evaluation. I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry. 
but where you see the blue line is telling you kind of a 50 kb molecule length. And this is the standard profile we see from the standard magatract extraction. Um, these are either fresh mosquitoes or mosquitoes that were stored right away at minus 80, so there was no chance for um, DNA to start degrading. And we typically get about 200 nanograms of high molecular weight DNA per mosquito from this approach. And this is, this is the profile of how that DNA looks. Um, so it's quite a smear, no real high molecular weight molecules there. The bulk is, is sort of hanging around 50 kb. Now the 10x modified magatract approach um, is a, it gives you a very different profile with the, with, with the molecules typically being greater than 150 kb. And in fact, some of them are really quite long. Um, so we've also done phenyl chloroform extractions, and this profile is very typical of a phenyl chloroform extraction too. And again, we're getting around 200 nanograms um, out of each mosquito with this approach. The particular, so um, earlier this year, we published a paper on um, a single mosquito assembly using the PacBio low input approach. And, and actually, the, the, the DNA we extracted at Sanger, we shipped over to um, PacBio. And the DNA we extracted, we did with this, with this kit, this 10X modified version, and it looked like this. But by the time it got to PacBio in California, it had a profile that you can see here where it says GDNA. So the molecules had broken during shipment. And then the, the resulting library um, is there in the, blue, in the blue plot. And what you can see is the majority of the molecules are larger than 10 kb where that purple line is, which is a good thing. Now we've tried to do some extractions and library preps here at Sanger using the low input approach. And we've tried this again with this kind of very high molecular weight band, which you can see in the top panel here. Um, we had a lot of small molecules in this extraction, and so we tried to clean it up a bit. And that's the post cleanup view you can see on the bottom half. And then that's repeated here on the top half of this slide. And the library that was generated from this, which is now in the bottom half of this slide, um, has too much DNA, too many molecules that are less than 10 kb. So we just we decided that this was not a good library to sequence. And it suggested to us that maybe that profile of this kind of input DNA that you see here at the top is not ideal for this low input approach. But I should mention also that PacBio is working on some new approaches right now to get rid of these less than 3 kb fragments that can cause um, problems in, your, in, your, in really getting good long molecules out of your PacBio run. So the other DNA extraction that we tried to generate a library for here, also from a wild mosquito, um, is the profile is presented here at the top, and this is using the standard MicroTract uh, kit. And you can see that we got um, about 380 nanograms out of this mosquito and cleaned it up again to try to get rid of some of the smaller stuff, and that's the profile on the bottom, which actually improved the situation quite a lot. And here it is repeated on the top. And now you can see the, the resulting library down in the bottom. So we sequenced this, and we did the same approaches we had done for the um, original mosquito, which Sarah will talk more about. And we sequenced this across three smart cells. And actually, this is a wild mosquito. We anticipated that because there's a lot of variation, we would be able to kind of to parse these into parental haplotypes pretty well. And in fact, 72% of the genome can be parsed into the parental haplotypes, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So, a summary, we are now using the Megatrack standard approach um, for good high molecular weight extractions. These are most well suited at the moment for the low input pack bio library prep. Just recommendations generally, when you're doing extractions, um, don't twist the pestle. Just do, we just do three to five up and down squish strokes, so you're, not, you're really not macerating the insect fully. Um, we use extremely slow pipetting with wide bore tip, tips. We don't drop the tubes, and we keep the DNA at four degrees um, if we're going to use it soon. And by soon, I mean within the next couple of months. Um, we also, I can't emphasize enough that the specimen really needs to be fresh or killed and immediately stored in minus 80. We're actually doing a variety of storage tests at the moment to see if we can find ways in which we can store mosquitoes at room temperature and get them here from our field collaborators without having to ship on dry ice. And I would, I'll be very happy to present on that when we have the results. Um, but at the moment, we're recommending that everything is stored in minus 80. So going forward, um, we are now testing this 8M smart cell, which, um, which uh, Sarah will talk about a little bit more. We're, try we're trying to do an F1 hybrid cross between the two different species. So the mother was Calutziae and the father is Gambi, and we're doing one single offspring from that. Um, and that will be pooled with a schisto worm to see if, with barcodes to see if we can 
um, demultiplex uh, pooling across the smart cell because it's actually overkill for a single mosquito that's 250 megabase genome. And then moving forward, we've got some Gates Foundation funding to um, try to build a blueprint for how to create high quality reference genomes for Anopheles mosquitoes using very few numbers. So potentially a single wild caught female from the field where you rear up her brood and we've got a set of partners in South America and Africa who are doing this with us, rearing up broods and then saving individual offspring for a variety of different approaches, including the low input pack biosequencing to get the bulk of the long read data and a single offspring for a morphological voucher, and then um, some for, R for RNA extraction for genome annotation. And then probably we'll pool the rest of the offspring because most of the other scaffolding technologies still require um, quite a lot of DNA or tissue. So just finally, um, I, last summer at the AGS meeting, um, which a lot of the I5K folks go to, I had given a talk and suggested that I think that there's some need to connect our communities better because we're kind of, many of us are banging our heads against the wall to try to figure out how to do extractions or how to store stuff or what gives us the right profile and the best resulting data. And I know that Matt Luce and Nick Lohman have started something called the Long Read Club, which I've which I've pasted, posted some stuff here on the slide, and they've got a couple of videos up now on their YouTube channel, and they are going to encourage people to post their complete, you know, vetted protocols and chat on Twitter. Um, I think that's all great, and I'm excited about Long Read Club. I'd also like to see some kind of place where there's a chat function and an ability to just kind of take a take a vote, <laughs> like how, what are people doing at the moment, how is it working for you, have you figured out any magic steps that, for example, help you preserve samples in the field and get them back and still give you high quality DNA at the end. So I've made up a Slack channel which is meant to be everything up until the assembly, so not the bioinformatics part, but um, all things up to assembly, which is atuda.slack.com. And this link, this tiny URL link, um, Y4DVU074, shouldn't expire. Anybody can join, it's free to join. I've set up a bunch of channels, there's no chat there at all, it's only me as a member. I have no idea if this is useful or not, but I thought I would just set it up because I think that there is some need across a variety of communities, not just I5K, but others as well, to try to share information and avoid treading over um, territory repeatedly. So with that, I will end and hand over to Sarah. Um, are you ready to go, Sarah? While she's setting up, I'll just thank um, especially the folks at PacBio for this work that you're going to hear much more about from Sarah and um, Katerina in my group who's been doing a ton of uh, high molecular weight extractions. Over to you, Sarah. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Mara. Um, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen, so let me know now if there's an issue. The slides look fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so Mara did a really good, uh, great introduction, so I'll try to make, um, you know, my intro slides fairly brief, but um, I don't think I need to convince um, you listening um, that high-quality reference genomes are essential tools for basic and applied research on plant and animal genomes. Um, PacBio has emerged as um, an important technology for uh, genome projects for plant and animal species that maybe of agricultural or economic or just pure research uh, importance. And PacBio has also been selected as um, the core technology for a lot of large genome initiatives like the Global Ant Genomics Alliance, um, the Sanger 25 Genomes Project, and the Vertebrate Genomes Project, among others. Um, but while we've seen a lot of progress in terms of the cost, the effort, and the quality, um, that uh, we can get with um, genome assemblies, there's still a lot of challenges that remain, particularly for um, small-bodied organisms like arthropods. Um, Mara touched on this, but specific to PacBio, we've historically had um, relatively high DNA input requirements on the order of micrograms, um, and this is just a total non-starter for a lot of research programs. Um, as Mara said, to get around this, um, you can inbreed your sample and pool related individuals but obviously not all um, organisms can be cultured in the lab, nor can even cultured insects be inbred. Um, and when you pool multiple individuals, particularly uh, unrelated ones, um, you'll introduce additional haplotypes, which complicates um, the genome assembly process. 
uh, particularly for arthropods, which tend to have much higher levels of variation um, than mammals, for example. So fortunately, um, from the computational side, uh, there are several kind of mature assembly approaches that can be used to resolve haplotypes during genome assembly. Um, the Falcon suite of assembly tools includes Falcon Unzip, which was developed um, by Jason Chin when he was at PacBio and, and um, PacBio and uh, academic collaborators. Um, and Falcon Unzip can capture regions of the genome that have high heterozygosity in assembly graph bubbles, shown here in the upper left, um, whereas haplotypes that are very similar between the parents, you know, the maternal and paternal haplotypes, when they're similar, they're um, captured as collapsed haplotypes. And so what Falcon Unzip, the assembler, does is output contiguous uh, primary contigs, which are actually pseudo-haplotypes and may contain uh, maternal and paternal haplotypes. And it also outputs um, a set of alternate haplotigs, which are phased haplotypes that represent the alternate path around the assembly bubbles. Um, and in collab last year in collaboration with um, Zev Cronenberg when he was at Phase Genomics, uh, he and I developed a tool called Falcon Phase, which integrates Hi-C data, the, the data type that's commonly used for um, scaffolding contig assemblies. Uh, we can apply Hi-C data to the Falcon Unzip output and extend the phasing beyond these smaller phase blocks, but extend phasing to the contig level. Um, another approach which um, was published last year uh, and developed by uh, Tim Smith at the USDA, Sergey Korin, Arang Ri, and others in Adam Philippi's lab um, is trio binning, which is um, implemented in Canoe. And this approach um, can generate um, uh, contig very um, long and contiguous haplotigs, so fully phased haplotig sequences. Um, the method requires a trio, so you collect uh, Illumina short read data from two parents, and from that you can discover um, a set of parent-specific markers that can then be used to um, bin the uh, pack bio reads from the offspring into maternal and paternal pools. And then these maternal and paternal pack bio read bins can then be haploid assembled with canoe and then the two haploid assemblies can be aligned and variants can be discovered between the maternal and paternal haplotypes. Um, so those are great methods once you're in the analysis phase, but to address um, the challenge of DNA input requirements for PacBio, um, we launched this collaboration with Mara and Matt Berryman, that's the Sanger. And so the goal of the project was to generate high quality PacBio de novo assemblies from single individuals of small bodied and largely, uh, which are often highly heterozygous organisms. So the protocol is um, similar to our standard library prep, except that it does not uh, include a DNA sharing step and it does not include a size selection step. And both of these measures are an effort to uh, reduce the amount of loss of material during the protocol. Um, the protocol relies on the recently released um, SmartBell Express Template Prep Kit version 2, um, which uses an add-only approach, so there's no transfer of, of material between tubes, again, in an effort to prevent loss of material. Um, the whole prep takes about three and a half hours. In lieu of size selection, we do two washes with, with the Ampere beads to remove some of the very small um, fragments, and we're still, there's an ongoing R&D effort to um, find ways to remove even larger fragments, you know, less than 3 to 5 kb, so that we can enrich these low input samples for longer reads. Um, and because we don't rely on shearing to fragment the DNA, we really rely on um, the genomic extraction uh, protocol to, um, to determine or, or to get a um, genomic fragment length distribution that lends itself to the library prep and the sequencing. So here on the bottom right is a femtopulse image for three different samples that we did in collaboration with Sanger. Um, so we're, gear, we're, we're shooting for um, very few fragments, less than 20 kb, and the bulk of the genomic DNA being between 20 kb and 100 kb. So when we began the collaboration with Sanger, 
Um, they did a bunch of genomic extractions for single um, Anopheles clusii mosquitoes, and we selected three samples shown here with the gel on the top and the femtopulse on the bottom left. Um, we chose samples three, five, and seven, and you can see in the table, um, oh, so the, the, the red lines is the 20 kb um, fragment size. So we're really looking, again, for most of the genomic DNA being longer than 20 kb. Um, we selected these three samples and sequenced one cell, and you can see that from the genomic DNA size distribution to the library size distribution to the uh, subread lengths, you do have a reduction um, in length. Um, so again, it's important with the genomic DNA to have a certain size profile that I described. So uh, we selected um, sample uh, five and sample seven for additional sequencing. Sample three, we didn't have enough uh, material to, to sequence additional samples. For sample five, we sequenced three cells total, but we only had nine-fold coverage of the genome, and so we weren't able to um, continue on with that sample uh, for assembly. So we focused on sample number seven, and this um, has been published in Genes uh, early this year, so if you want to read more details, there's the, um, the publication. So here's some more details on the three cells that we, the three sequencing cells that we ran for mosquito number seven. Um, and I want to introduce um, a, an important term that is really critical for these low input samples, which is unique molecular yield versus total yield. Um, so on the bottom left, you can see a cartoon of a PacBio Smart Bell library molecule where the, the region of interest or the, or the insert of genomic DNA is shown in yellow and purple. And in blue are the hairpin adapter sequences. And so this molecule is circular. And during uh, PacBio sequencing, the polymerase can uh, sequence around this molecule, the circular molecule, multiple times, generating multiple subreads of the region of interest. And so what we've seen in the most recent chemistry update, version 3.0, sequel chemistry is a, a drastic increase in um, the polymerase read length, so the, read, the length of the reads, um, the single read around this molecule multiple times. So the polymerase reads are processed into subreads of just the region of interest. And so the total yield on a cell is, all, is the total length of all the polymerase reads, but for genome assembly, we're only interested in a single uh, read per molecule. So um, you, know, you can see that the total yield on these three cells was you know, about 24 gigs, but the unique molecular yield was only four, about four gigabases, because we're only selecting one read per molecule. Additional reads are used for polishing, so it helps improve the, um, the base quality of the resulting assembly, but for the, uh, the genome assembly process, additional reads of molecules does not help. It would just slow down the process, and that's why we don't, we don't use those. Um, the total, the N50 polymerase read length is shown here. The subread length is shown um, in the table as well. These were run as 20-hour movies, which is probably overkill. We would now recommend 10-hour movies um, because you don't have gains in the unique um, reads. The P statistics are, are summarizing um, loading success, so we're shooting for high P1. That's the percentage of reaction wells that have a single molecule loaded. So how much should you sequence? We, um, with the mosquito number seven sample, we did a um, coverage titrar cell titration. Um, and while sequencing from a single cell, we only had 17-fold um, coverage of the genome, and the assembly length was very short, 150 megabases with very low contiguity. Um, both the two and the three cell assemblies looked, oops, looked really good. Um, and so from this, we uh, would recommend at least 30-fold unique molecular coverage for a sample like a, a mosquito. Um, and you can see that when we look for the um, conserved uh, dipterin busco genes, we see even the two-cell assembly looks quite complete with 97% of the busco genes present and full length. Um, and even the two-cell assembly had a contig N50 greater than one megabase, which is kind of what we strive for. 
Um, so we, um, we decided to proceed with the three cell assembly for the paper. Um, and uh, we did several um, curation steps to generate a haploid version of the, of the genome. Um, so in the upper right is a cartoon of the Falcon and Zip output. So you have your contiguous primary contigs and your alternate haplotig set. Um, and here I'm showing oosh, the um, assembly staffs for the primary contigs, so total length, number of primary contigs, contig N50 for the primaries, the uh, total length of the alternate haplotigs, and uh, two measures from BUSCO, the percentage of complete genes and the percentage of uh, duplicate genes. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Okay, background noise. Um, so the BUSCO stats are just for the primary contig set. And we're using this duplicate um, percentage to try to, it's a, it's a very easy way to estimate how, how many duplicated haplotypes you have in the primary contig set. Um, so after we ran Falcon and Zip, we found that about 30% of the assembly had both haplotypes resolved, uh, and that about 4% of the BUSCO genes appeared duplicated in the primary set. So we ran um, a tool called Purge Haplotigs, which is developed by Mike Roach. Um, and this identifies candidate duplicate haplotypes in the primary set by using um, read coverage depth. And then it performs alignments between um, these candidate contigs and the other primary contigs to identify um, high sequence identity contig pairs. And then it removes the shorter um, contig in that pair and puts it into the um, the haplotype, haplotig bin. Um, so you can see after running purge haplotigs, we have a higher, we have, um, you know, we've, we've moved more contigs into the alternate, alternate set, and we have about 35% of the genome um, uh, contained in haplotigs and a reduction in the BUSCO duplicate um, measure down to 2.4%. And this purge haplotigs version is the version that we submitted to NCBI and what was um, analyzed in the genes paper. But since then, um, Maura's graduate student, uh, Haynes Heaton, has run another round of curation with a tool called HaploMerger, um, which identifies high identity partial contig alignments and then merges these contigs together, resecting one of the duplicate haplotypes and putting that into the alternate bin. And so running haplomerger has, an, has a benefit in terms of the primary contig N50. It boosted it to 5.7 megabases, and it really reduced um, the, the BUSCO duplicate percentage because um, whereas purge haplotigs removes total, like single full-length contigs, haplomerger can remove partial contigs that have duplicated haplotypes. So here's an example of before and after um, running haplomerger. So on the top, we have the, uh, the five major chromosome arms for Anopheles calusii, as well as the unknown contig set. And the y-axis is, uh, so we aligned all the PAC bio contigs to the Anopheles gambii reference, the pest reference. And then um, the y-axis in these uh, six plots is uh, the, co the contig coverage. So most of the contigs align uh, uniquely to the pest reference, but there are regions where we have PacBio contigs overlapping, and so those are like the coverage two regions. And we're highlighting one region on uh, chromosome 3L, and you can see on the upper right that, that there's three PacBio contigs that overlap with each other just on their ends. Um, and so this is the kind of uh, phenomenon that haplo merger can address. And so after running haplomerger, on the bottom left, you can see very few regions with contig2 coverage and uh, a resolution of these overlapping three contigs into a single contig. So um, since we ran the proof of concept Anopheles calusii sample, we've, um, we've applied the low DNA input protocol to a number of different samples. Uh, including a protist, um, two dipterins, some drosophila, uh, additional mosquitoes, um, a schistosoma parasitic flatworm from Matt Berryman, and then our internal PacBio control rice sample. Um, so in the upper left, you can see that the genome sizes of the organisms range from 24 megabases in the case of the protist up to uh, greater than 400 
or about 400 megabases for rice. Um, and we've used anywhere from 50 to, to 150 nanograms of genomic DNA. Um, the protocol can be scaled, so um, the, more the more DNA you have, the more library you can make, <clears throat> the more cells you can run, and the larger genome you can assemble. Um, internally, some of the best um, library preps that we've generated have had enough library to sequence a one gigabase genome, but um, we're conservatively recommending 150 nanograms for a 300 megabase genome. Um, the protocol is definitely possible with larger genomes, but the results are, are less consistent, so user beware. Um, and in addition, if you have microgram quantities of DNA, we definitely recommend using the standard uh, library prep protocol with size selection, if possible. Um, and in terms of assembly, we just employ um, standard assembly methods using Falcon. And we, across all of the samples that we've looked at, we get, a, we get contig N50s greater than one megabase for samples when we have more than 30-fold unique molecular coverage. And that's shown on the bottom plot. Um, we've, uh, here I'm zooming in, so we're losing that um, one of the, the Drosophila erecta female sample that had really high contiguity. Um, but um, you can see the, read, the average read lengths that we're getting for these samples, um, the expected and the expected genome size and the assembly size. Um, so really the main drivers for um, the quality of the assembly is coverage with needing more than 30-fold coverage recommended and read lengths. So for example, looking at the two, two Drosophila sample, the female had um, eight and a half KB read lengths, whereas the male had a little less than 7 KB, and the contiguity on these two samples was dramatically different. Um, and so just to end this part of the talk with a little perspective um, on some of the mosquito assemblies that I've personally been involved with at PacBio, um, the first, one of the first projects I worked on when I started at PacBio in 2016 was the 80s Egypti genome, um, and this uh, was a, a long, uh, you know, a project that required a lot of effort, um, and it was only, it was finally published late last year in Nature. Um, and the project was led by Ben Matthews and Leslie Voschel at Rockefeller. Um, the other two samples here are the Anopheles Calusii, mosquito number seven sample that I talked about before, and then this newer assembly Mara mentioned. Anopheles arabiensis, which all of the work for the last sample was done at Sanger. So PacBio didn't really have a hand in this, this work at all. Um, so with the 80s project, because of the high DNA requirements at the time, um, Ben Matthews had to perform four generations of inbreeding and then pool 80 males, um, 80 male pupae, and he had to do several genomic extractions to get sufficient DNA. Um, we had to sequence 177 smart cells, which was using the PacBio RS2 platform at the time, in order to get um, sufficient coverage to assemble um, this 1.3 gigabase genome. Obviously, the 80s example is it's a more challenging genome than the Anopheles just because it's larger, but um, you know, just the, the raw amount of material that we needed and the number of smart cells um, is, is, was pretty daunting. Um, but in contrast with the Anopheles samples, using the low input protocol, we were able to uh, use just a single individual. We sequenced three um, smart cells, and we got great assemblies with, you know, less than 50-fold coverage. So the, the main effort with the Anopheles samples was just doing the multiple DNA preps. Once we had good DNA preps, everything else was, was fairly straightforward after that. Um, so I'm just going to spend the last couple minutes um, giving you um, a flavor of what is to come with PacBio. Um, some of you may know that PacBio has a new sequencing platform called the SQL2, uh, and this, this is uh, currently in an early access program with a, a limited number of sites, and the full commercial release will happen um, next quarter. Um, so the SQL2 smart cell has um, 8 million reaction wells compared to 1 million reaction wells on SQL. Um, and this is the first, um, the first uh, insect data that I've seen that's been uh, generated with the SQL2. 
So this is a um, 15 KB size selected library for the spotted lanternfly, which was done in collaboration with Scott Gieb and others at um, the USDA. Uh, and the spotted lanternfly is an invasive um, plant hopper species that the USDA, USDA is monitoring closely uh, because it's a pest in the eastern U.S. on um, a lot of um, important crop plants like grapes, apples, and pine. Um, so we sequenced this library on both the SQL 1M and the SQL 2 8M. Um, we sequenced 10 cells on 1M and only a single cell on 8M, and we were able from that single cell on 8M generate um, over 130 gigabases of sequence, of which more than 80 gigabases were unique molecule reads. Um, the read lengths were longer on the 8M run compared to the 1M, and we, I was able to assemble both of these. Um, remarkably, one, one cell on SQL2, we were able to assemble this, um, this, this genome, which is almost human size. It's the 2.45 gigabase genome. So I was really excited to see these results, and I think um, it's going to reduce the price point for uh, genome assemblies, even for large, complex genomes like this one. Um, Mara mentioned this, but um, we're continuing to collaborate with the Sanger, and we're starting to work on um, barcoding and multiplexing um, low DNA input samples. Right now, we're focusing on um, some of the samples that we've already sequenced, just um, to make sure we're getting everything right. And I'm sure, um, you know, the, the, this is in the early stages, so we don't have anything to report beyond that. Um, and then another exciting thing happening at PacBio is um, a recent innovation in circular consensus sequencing. Um, as I showed you before when we were discussing um, unique molecular versus total yield, um, the 3.0 SQL chemistry has led to incredible gains in polymerase read length, which is shown in the yellow plot in the bottom left. Uh, and this allows, as I said, many more passes around the circular library molecule than were previously possible. So um, the process subreads uh, can be aligned and a consensus sequence can be generated, um, which has much higher accuracy than the individual subread sequences. So we call these consensus sequences hi-fi reads. So CCS, uh, or circular consensus sequencing, is the sequencing mode. These are size-selected libraries that are selected to have a very tight um, size distribution. So not necessarily applicable for low input samples, but um, you know, if you have a cell line or a stock and you're not limited on DNA, CCS is a really exciting um, way to go. So CCS is the sequencing mode or the library type. The reads generated are called hi-fi reads. Um, and even though we, I'm showing you one of the, I think the first PacBio publication from 2009, which did, um, you know, debut CCS as a concept, and we've been, PacBio has been doing CCS for years, it's just the limited polymerase read lengths um, kind of uh, restricted CCS to much smaller fragments, you know, several KB, and now with the 3.0 chemistry, we're able to do CCS mode um, in, for libraries that are 10, 20, hopefully even longer uh, in the future. So we have a, a bioarchive preprint. Uh, this paper is currently in review, so if you want to read more details, um, I'll refer you to the preprint. Um, and then, um, obviously, the, uh, the accuracy of the HiFi consensus reads um, increases with additional passes. So on SQL 1M, with 10 passes of, this, of the uh, insert, uh, you can achieve QV30, which is 0.2% error rate. Um, it's even better on SQL 2 8M with eight passes resulting in QV30. Um, and these HiFi reads can be used for uh, de novo genome assembly. They can be used for structural variant detection. And they, because of their high accuracy, they can even be used for single nucleotide variant analysis. Um, and finally, um, I just want to mention ISOSeq which is um, isoform sequencing. It's the PacBio offering for RNA sequencing. Um, and uh, so I, I, this isoform sequencing allows you to sequence um, the full isoform um, without requiring any uh, assembly as you would do with traditional paired end Illumina data. 
Um, ISOSeq allows um, more accurate construction of alternatively spliced transcripts, uh, and it's incredibly useful for genome annotation. Uh, you can also even use it to generate a reference transcriptome um, that you could then use as your reference to do quantitative studies using more traditional Illumina RNA-seq. Um, the 3.0 chemistry and recent software improvements for ISOSeq um, ha have led to increases in the number of genes that can be resolved per smart cell. Uh, we have support for multiplexing, so you can pool multiple tissues or samples um, for, for a genome annotation project. And here I'm just showing a couple uh, examples in the literature of publications that use ISOSeq for genome annotation and um, alternative splicing characterization. Uh, and I'll leave you with just some resources. The Smart Bell Express Template Prep Kit 2.0 was recently released. This is required for the low DNA input protocol. The protocol will hopefully be will, will be released in three to five weeks. Here's a teaser screenshot of it. Um, we're working our way through official channels so we can get get the protocol in your hands as soon as possible. Um, Falcon Assembler details are here. Some some interesting publications. Um, and then uh, hopefully, yeah, it looks like we have time for questions. So thanks very much. Thank you both so much, Mauro. That's really some beautiful and it's definitely um, extensive mosquito work. And Sarah, this is great to see all of the really exciting things going on at PacBio and some really some good details too about uh, the, the nitty gritty of these assemblies. Um, <clears throat> I've got uh, several questions that have been sent in, but let me just go ahead and double check first if there's anybody uh, that wants to ask their question verbally. Uh, I'll, I'll give a moment here so people can unmute and, and uh, just speak up. I'm not hearing anything right away. Um, we did have Robert ask about the availability of the new SQL2 flow cell. And Jonas has kindly replied in the chat um, saying that, that it should be coming av available in, um, in a few months. So, <clears throat> so we'll be able to get our hands on that soon. Um, Robert did also ask that they're using uh, ARIMA genomics uh, to do their high C, uh, and they haven't found that they can use this data set with the Falcon phase um, because the enzymes are different. Um, mm. So is that the case that they can only use Falcon Space if they get their high C from a specific company, or can um, the protocol be adjusted uh, to other high C providers? Do you happen to know that, Sarah? Yeah, I do. So uh, when we first developed Falcon Phase, that was the case, but we've since um, updated the method so that you can you can input the particular um, restriction enzyme recognition site in your configuration file, so any HI-C data can be used for Falcon Phase. Great. Um, okay, and then we also had a question from Meg Allen. Do you know if there's a, any difference in extraction uh, quality between using larva, pupa, or adults? Mara, do you want to take that one? Mara, do you need to unmute? I just unmuted her. It may take a second. Okay, to great. Go ahead, Mara. Sorry, I didn't realize my computer was controlling the phone. Um, so um, the only thing I can say about that is that we, for mosquitoes anyway, we get quite a lot more DNA from pupae. We haven't tried actually sequencing any of that or generating libraries from that. I don't suspect there would be problems with that. Um, we haven't tried larvae. So I guess if you have insects that are in the pupil stage and you know what you're dealing with, um, I would, and, and you really are short on DNA, you might try the pupil stage. Uh, for us, we got a lot more DNA at that level. Okay, great. Um, I know I, it does sound like from what I've also heard that there's definitely some differences there, and it, it, it's worth uh, testing with your specific creature. Um, Surya, uh, Mara had a question. Uh, in terms of the Slack channel that you created, uh, is do you need to create a login um, on the Slack channel before you can join? Um, probably, yes. You have to have a Slack 
um, okay. account. So if you okay. aren't on any other Slacks, then yeah, you you would need to make a login. But then everything else from there should be easy, and you should just show up. I've actually seen a few people join already, so that's that's exciting. Okay, so like go ahead and create free, a, an account, free account for yourself. Login. What was that? I'm sorry, Glenn. It looks like it's a free account to log into Slack if you want to. It is. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a free account. And so, yeah, go ahead and make yourself a Slack account, and then from there you'll follow that invite link, and you should be able to join. Um, yep, so that, and like you said, it looks like people are, are getting on. I think we've tested that here, so uh, that's great. Um, another question. Um, you, Sarah, you discussed the genome size limit, but could you also speak uh, to the effects of, like, the level of repeats in the genome and to how well that performs with the low input foot kit and the final assembly continuity? Sure. Um, I don't have any sort of like very specific numbers, but you know, obviously the larger genomes tend to have more repeats. Um, so you can kind of, for smaller genomes, you can tolerate um, shorter, you know, read lengths. Um, so, you know, with the with the Drosophila and the mosquito samples, things come together very nicely. When we had, I think average read lengths of 8 kb, uh, N50 around 11 or 13 kb. Even with the rice, that was a larger genome, almost 400 megabases, and the read lengths weren't any longer for the rice libraries than they were for the insects. So, um, you know, you'll with shorter read lengths, you'll suffer on contiguity, but you might still get, you know, a total assembly length that is what you're expecting. It'll just be more fragmented. But, you know, we're, I mentioned this, um, but we're experimenting with um, methods to, uh, like the Ampure um, beads reduces uh, the, the number of short fragments in the library. We're experimenting with other methods um, to kind of increase the size of those fragments that we remove um, so that we can load longer fragments on the sequencer. Do you guys, hey, this is Fringy. Do you guys want a really nice, big, difficult genome to test? <laughs> um, I don't know. Tell me more. I, I was thinking about the velvet worm in particular. It's about four and a half gig. It's the outgroup to the arthropods, and um, it's been tough for a lot of people. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, uh, it would be one of those, if you can do that, you can do anything. Yeah, I mean, it, that would definitely need to be size selected. Um, and But, you know, the results from the, the lanternfly were so encouraging on 8M that, you know, it's possible you could get a good assembly with two, maybe three 8M cells on that kind of sample. Do you have a lot of material for that velvet worm? Or is it That's pretty big, so it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I mean, that Thanks would be a good much. candidate for the 8M, 8M platform. Okay. Um, thank you, Fringy, for that question. Um, uh, another question from Mara. Can you speak a little bit about the steps you took to clean up your extractions? You mo mentioned that you had some post-extraction cleanup. So um, there were a couple of slides there where there was some Ampere cleanup that um, Karen Oliver here in our long read team did just to try to remove some of the shorter fragments. The cleanup steps um, that would happen before that, if you, if you ended up with a profile distribution that you were happy with, you wouldn't have to do any more cleanup. The kit, the Magatrack kit itself produces, um, you know, a profile that should be suitable in most cases, I would hope, for um, going directly into library prep. So the only reason those cleanups were happening in those couple of slides I showed about our test set saying are what to try to get rid of some of those smaller fragments. Okay, great. Is there somebody else uh, asking a question there? I think, okay, we might just be background noise. If not, go ahead and, and uh, type your question in if we're just not being able to hear you uh, loudly enough. Um, 
Laura, you mentioned that you saw some degradation with some of your shipments. Is that something that you usually see? And um, do you guys have any thoughts on reducing that degradation um, if you're if you don't have the uh, ability to sequence in house? Um, right. So <laughs> I think we got lucky with the shipment in that it degraded just to a perfect profile for PacBio. If they had tried on the high molecular weight, um, you know, as I was showing you, sort of 10x modified extraction that we'd actually done was sort of not the right profile, not an ideal profile because of the lack of shearing um, that happens in this low input protocol. So um, I don't have, uh, I mean, I guess if you know that you're going to ship your DNA, then perhaps you should try the 10x modified protocol. Um, the, we did actually try um, something called DNA Stable Plus, which is supposed to protect molecules from shearing um, from, you know, forces. And it, in our hands, it didn't really show any impact. So we did tests where we put DNA Stable Plus into the um, DNA to protect it and then dropped it on the floor and we can see shearing, or we shipped it and we can see shearing. So um, that doesn't help. I think... Um, yeah, so this, I guess this is an issue if you've got a ship DNA, um, and it's a good question that I haven't thought a lot about. So I don't, yeah, I mean, I would maybe try to do the two, if you have two samples, try to do one with the standard and one with the 10X modified and ship both and hope that one of them looks right still. Um, that could be an option. Sarah, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> I only touch the data when it once it's on my computer. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is Jonas. Maybe I can I can add that. Um, and Mara mentioned this. We are working on a protocol to remove uh, fragments up to about three or four kb. And I have uh, good hopes that with that um, a protocol, which is currently in development, so we're not ready to talk about it yet, but uh, it's looking promising. We'll be able to rescue some of those samples that have um, that Mara showed that would start out with a, a really high molecular weight of phenotype. So in that case, uh, both of these types of um, initial profiles would then be, be usable. So we're working for that, uh, to that, and we'll let you know when that um, looks good. Thank you. Kevin, I see Thank you have you. your hand raised. Do you want to try your question now? Yeah, I was just wondering if, uh, this is Kevin Haggett, it seems like the the, the uh, sequencing and assembly has been going fantastically, and it seems like the extraction is a bottleneck. So I was curious about this group that's formed the Long Read Club by Matt Lewis and Nick Lowen. I don't think they're on the call right now. But uh, they're going to focus on extraction and different methods, and uh, my understanding? I think they're focusing on kind of any long read approaches or technology, including um, how to do assemblies. Um, but I guess that there will be protocols that people post that are around extractions. They've got one YouTube video posted I saw, I think yesterday, um, interviewing um, a woman from 10X, I believe, who was talking about her experiences doing high molecular weight extractions. So that is a good place to start. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, this is kind of why I formed this Slack group, because I think that there are people trying things all over the place, and we don't have a really great way of saying what's worked and what hasn't worked. You're not going to write a paper about it. You're not going to, um, you know, share your failures, necessarily. So I think it's good to have a place to just say, we tried all these things, and all these things failed, but this one thing looks pretty good. What are other people's experiences? Okay, thanks. Well, um, well, who was that? Go ahead. Sorry, that was fringy. I can't work the mute. Um, why don't we try to get experiences from a number of species, and why not write a paper? I mean, it doesn't have to go anywhere fancy, but it would be good. I, I, I'm going to just speak up for everyone here and say I think that would be a great idea. Um, and so next month, I'm just going to go ahead and plug now. Next month's uh, webinar will be uh, discussing the Earth Biogenomes Project um, as well as the USDA's project called the Ag 100 Test. Um, 
And as part of our project within the USDA, we are forming as teams, and one of our teams is focused on extraction, and this is sort of their goal, is, is to sort of figure out what universal truths there are, if there are any, um, or are there truths along lines of taxa or whatnot um, that we can find that would sort of help prioritize uh, sequencing approaches and uh, issues. Um, so I think that the people that are interested in that, um, that's one of the things that we hope will be coming out um, from, from our group. And, uh, but I think that it really is something that we need to do as a larger community though too. So um, if anyone has interest in that, you can certainly email me and um, Scott Guybe is gonna be the head of that team and we can uh, try to connect everybody in that space to see uh, you know, and maybe get that onto this uh, Slack channel as well to see how we can really uh, do this as a community. Yeah, this is Jonas just quickly adding that this happened in the Vertebrate Genome Project. Uh, they've had a, a dedicated group and they are planning to write a paper uh, for about a year and two months now. And um, I've been involved in that a little bit and it's been extremely useful to, to information exchange. Obviously, it's very different, but, uh, you know, they discuss whether liver works better than kidney and so forth. And, and so that's been really beneficial for a number of groups trying to do uh, vertebrates. So I, I think the same kind of benefits would, would apply here for sure. I think that's um, all good to hear. And I hope that um, through the channels that exist already or if people make new channels, they share them with us because we would like to be part of this community. And for what it's worth, if people join the Slack channel, then I will post our results um, on a weekly basis of how our extraction approaches are going um, and keep everyone informed for, I mean, we're focused primarily on mosquitoes at the moment, but still testing a variety of different things. So I'm, I'm happy to share all of that information. This is, can we, uh, this is exactly the community we want to build. What was that, Fringy? I was going to say, Anna, can, can we um, advertise that from the I5K workspace? Yes. Um, so what I'll go ahead and do is um, I can send an email and I can also post the information about this Slack channel. We can get it up onto the um, I5K GitHub website and I can send it out as an email through um, the, uh, the Arthropod Genome uh, uh, Lister that I usually send the updates about this webinar through. Yeah, that would be great. Then everyone can, um, can follow Mara and it'll, the world will be a better place. All right, and so let me see if we've got, I'm, I'm trying to bounce through a lot of screens here. I think, um, so I think you guys spoke about the importance of really investing some time in the extraction phase and I think you showed that really nicely because you showed that you didn't do one extraction and move with it. You know, you did look like something like 10 there sometimes. And then from that chose one or two to proceed to the next step and then and then eventually choose one for the, the library phrase from. Can you speak a little bit about um, why you don't want those small fragments on the SQL system um, and, you know, the preferential loading issues or, or that sort of thing? Can, just to help people understand that the reasons that that's important. Sure. Um, yeah, we still, there is some preferential loading of the smaller fragments. Um, and so that's going to, when you have smaller fragments in your library, they're going to load preferentially and it's just going to reduce the overall yield of that cell. Um, and so you end up, you know, just not generating as much data as you would with the with the larger um, fragments. So it's sort of both you're losing out on the longer fragments that might be present in the library and you're just reducing your yield. Oh, and then there's like the third factor of just, you know, longer reads help you span the repeats and the, you know, challenging parts of the genome. All right. So I, I think, um, trying to check three different screens here, it looks like that's the last of the questions that I've received. Is there anyone else that wants to ask a question? If not, um, we can go ahead and wrap up. I'll just answer your extraction question there about why we've done so many extractions. Um, they are variable between insects, even that have been stored at the same, you know, presumably stored in exactly the same way at the same time. And some of it may be down to, um, 
the size of the organism. Um, we, see, we certainly see DNA quantity differences between males and females. Um, but also, I think if the mosquito like, is on its last legs, you know, maybe things are already, some of our samples are coming from the field. We know they've been in Midas 80 the whole time. They get to us and they still don't look good. Um, so potentially our collaborators, you know, kind of the mosquito is there and kind of vaguely alive, but not, not particularly robustly healthy. So we, and in the lab mosquitoes, the colony mosquitoes that we work with, we still also see a lot of variation um, in these extractions. So I think it is a good kind of approach um, once you've got your head around how to do the extractions to try to multiplex them and do several at a time because they do show variation and there's usually one that stands out as like the best one to go with. Fabulous. All right, with that, I just want to thank you both again for an amazing presentation and thank everyone that called in um, for all your participation and your great questions as well. Um, so just as a reminder, again, next month we'll have another webinar, but that one will be focused on the Earth Biogenomes Project and, and the uh, Ag 100 Pest Project uh, through the USDA in support of that Earth Biogenomes Project. So with that, thank you everyone and have a great